All right, everyone, let's get started. So today's topic is um, language modeling, which is, again, uh, as I mentioned last lecture, one of the core topics of natural language processing and is um, one of the underlying models behind almost every NLP-based technology that we see today. So in this lecture, we will cover first the basics of the task um, and then go through some very simple language models that rely on counting and then dividing, nothing too fancy. Um, your homework zero was released and a lot of the questions can be directly answered from material in this lecture and in the next lecture. Keep in mind that that is due on uh, Friday, so um, you should get started on that. Uh, soon. Um, okay, so uh, first let's just uh, take a step back and consider the importance of language modeling within the broader context of um, NLP applications. So we talked a lot about sentiment analysis in the last class as an example of a particular type of NLP application. So again, here you're given some piece of text and asked to classify its sentiment, like is it positive or negative or so on. So in the past, I to build a sentiment analysis model, I would take a labeled data set of reviews. So maybe I would crawl Amazon, as I said before. I get a bunch of pieces of reviews paired with um, the scores from those reviews. And let's say here I took them from IMDB, so they're movie reviews. I would train a model to predict the score of the review given the text of the review. And this model would be trained from scratch based on um, the reviews in this data set. So this is how sentiment analysis and many other tasks were handled up until just maybe four years ago. And then things started to change. So nowadays, we use um, a, a version of transfer learning in which we first take a huge amount of unlabeled text, which I can get in huge quantities from the internet or from published works of uh, like literature, textbooks, blog posts, whatever. Um, and I can train a very large self-supervised model. So this step is called self-supervised pre-training and language modeling is basically the choice task for um, this kind of self-supervised pre-training. Pre so if you remember from the last class, and as I will go over in this class, language modeling is the task of, given some context, predict the next word that comes right after that. So I can get labels for this task for free from any unlabeled data set. And also, as we discussed in the last class, a model that is good at predicting the next word knows a lot about the language on which it's trained to do this task, right? It knows about the general meanings of words, the syntax, the grammar, and so on. All of these properties that you might expect would transfer to any other task, including sentiment analysis. So we take this huge self-supervised model and we fine tune it on the labeled IMDB data set that we have of uh, sentiment. And so here, you can see that in contrast to the first setting, now we have two stages, and in the first stage, we see a lot more data than we would if we just trained a model from scratch on IMDB reviews. So this model, after step two, is hopefully more powerful and more generalizable than the model in the first uh, uh, first slide here. So again, this is basically the approach that is used uh, nowadays for almost every NLP task. And in this lecture, we'll focus on the core task behind this first stage, which is called the pre-training stage. So we won't talk again in this lecture about transfer learning. We'll focus specifically on the task of language modeling. But just keep this in mind, this is where we're going for the rest of the next two weeks we're going to aim to get to this point where you can understand what does it mean to pre-train a model and then fine-tune it to solve 
some different um, NLP tasks and how do I actually build a process that does this? Okay, so let's get to our task, language modeling. The goal is quite simple. It's given a piece of text. I want to assign a probability to that piece of text. So um, you might ask, why would we ever want to do this? I've already given you one reason on the previous slide. But there are much more concrete applications of language models that are more intuitive to understand. So let's say that I have a machine translation system. And my machine translation system takes in some text in, say, French. And it outputs a set of candidate translations for that sentence. So one of those candidates could be, I flew to the movies, and the other is, I went to the movies. Um, so machine translation systems generally tend to produce um, multiple possible outputs. And you might want to rank those outputs based on some, um, you know, some type of score. So a language model, if it assigns a higher probability to more plausible sentences and a lower pro pl a probability to implausible sentences, might tell you that I went to the movies is far more probable than I flew to the movies and therefore if you were judging based on the plausibility of the sentence uh, perhaps you should output the second translation instead of the first. It's also very important in speech recognition. So in speech recognition you're given some audio signal and asked to decode you know, what text was said by the person in the, in the audio. So here, I saw a van versus eyes uh, of an, they sound pretty much, well, they sound very similar to each other, but of course the second one is not grammatical in any way, and the first one is much more reasonable, so a language model may be able to tell you that, you know, you should stick with the first one here. So these are some applications, as we'll see later on in the semester, there are many, many others. Um, also, as we'll see later in this lecture, language models give you not only the joint probability of a piece of text, but also the conditional probability of every word in that sentence given all the words that come before it. Um, and these two things are related through the chain rule of probability. So with a language model, all of your autocompletes on your phones or emails are powered by language models. Um, Google you know, has this autocomplete, but not only this, this is just a direct application of a language model, but Google search itself has language models like neural language models as integral components of the search algorithm. So every time you type in a search for Google to find, you know, sentences that are highlighted in web pages that are relevant to your query, all of those types of things are relying on um, large scale neural language models. So, Language models are very pervasive nowadays in, in NLP technology. Okay, so let's uh, be a bit more concrete. Our goal is to compute the probability of a sentence, or maybe more broadly, a sequence of words. So we'll use this notation here, uh, W sub 1, W sub 2. This indicates the word at position 1, the word at position 2, word at position 3, and so on. Um, and as I just mentioned on that autocomplete slide, this task is related to the task of predicting the next word given a sequence of words that preceded it. So given W sub 1 to W sub 4, I might want to predict the word that comes next, W sub 5. Um, and so a model that computes either of these is called the language model. And we can compute this joint probability of the entire piece of text by using the chain rule. So let's say that I have the sequence it's water is so transparent that. And I want to compute the probability of this partial uh, sentence. So in order to do that, I might factorize this probability into the product of conditional probabilities. So if you recall basic probability definitions, the definition of conditional probability is over here. So given this P of B given A is just the joint probability divided by the marginal probability of A. And if we think about the uh, words at each position as being one of these um, events here, then we can use the chain rule, and um, which, which if you look at it here, the joint probability of A, B, C, and D is just the probability of A, the first thing in the sequence, 
times the conditional probability of B given A times the conditional probability of C given A and B, and so on. So you get this product of conditional probabilities, right? This is the, the basic chain rule of probability, and we can apply this to uh, text as well. So the probability of this sequence, word sub 1 to word sub n, is the product of the conditional probabilities of each word, w sub i, given all of the words that occur preceding, uh, right before this word. So in your homework and in subsequent lectures, we will re uh, refer to the, um, all of the words that come before the current word as the prefix. So the task of language modeling then boils down to, given a prefix, give me the word that follows the prefix, right? And give me a probability distribution over the entire vocabulary of words that I have in my language of what the next word is. That is essentially what we are asking. So in our example from before, its water is so transparent. This breaks down into the probability of its times the probability of water conditioned on its being the previous word times the probability of is given its water, blah, blah, blah. Right? That's pretty clear. So if the prefix is very long and the probability of kind of each word is, is quite small, um, in practice, would you maybe take the log probability and sum them? Yeah, so the question is, so if you have a very long prefix or if you have a really rare word or some combination of these things, this probability here might be extremely small. You might have things like underflow errors if you actually code this up. So what do you do in that case? Uh, we'll talk about that later in this lecture, but yes, you're correct. We generally just use the log and then sum the logs instead of taking the product of the uh, raw probabilities. Other questions? Okay, so let us move on to how do we actually get these probabilities? So this is the goal of a language model. Now, one easy thing is just to say, well, I could count the occurrence of every possible prefix in my language, and then I could just divide um, by the next word plus that prefix over the count of the prefix, right? So this is just counting and dividing. If I wanted to compute the probability of the word the, given the prefix, its water is so transparent that I would count up all the occurrences of this string, its water is so transparent that the, and then divide it by its water is so transparent that. So what are some issues with doing this? What's that? The complexity of calculating? Yeah, so I have to keep track of exponential number of counts, right? And another problem is just that, uh, what if I have an extremely long uh, sequence here, right? So it's ne never gonna be possible for me to compute, count every possible thing. And also I'll have, even if it were possible, I would have an extremely sparse table as well, right? Because most uh, combinations of words are just not going to be observed because they're ungrammatical or whatever. So there are many issues with this, but basically it's too sparse and way too memory intensive to actually store all of these counts and do this count and divide approach. So we need to do something smarter. And uh, today we'll look at a simplification of this count and divide approach, which basically says that Okay, I mean, its water is so transparent that the, that's very long. But what if I just keep the, um, oh, sorry, I was, the prefix is in the denominator. So its water is so transparent that that's very long. But what if instead of storing the count of this entire prefix, I just store the count for a part of this prefix? So I can chop off some of the words that are most distant in this, context, in this prefix and just store the last word, or the last two words, or the last three words. So here now it becomes much more manageable for me to count up all of the occurrences of this prefix. So in this case, I might just store the count of transparent that, and not ignore all of this part. In general, um, we are going to apply the Markov assumption, so that's what I was talking about, where 
the probability of the given its water is so transparent that we could simplify to the probability of the given that, the very last word in the sequence. So this is called a bigram model, which means that this model does not get the full context of the prefix before um, estimating this probability. It only considers the very last word of the prefix. So this is a huge simplification, right? Uh, why is that? Why, why might this be bad? Even in, if for this specific context, why would it be bad to approximate the probability of the given its water is so transparent that with the probability of the given that? Yeah, so if we do this, we have no idea that there's water in this prefix. We have no idea that it's transparent. So what can we really say? We might be able to make some sort of a judgment based on the syntax or co-occurrence statistics, how often that follows the, sorry, how often the follows the word that. But we can't say anything about the meaning of this prefix, right? Because we, the is not a very meaningful word and that is not a very meaningful word. Um, that is not uh, particularly, um, it's not a prefix with a lot of semantic information, so our probability distribution is not going to be particularly informative. Um, the trade-off, though, even though this is a huge simplification, is that this is very easy to solve with the count and divide approach, right? Because now, I only have to keep track of basically a matrix of here are all the words, single words that precede any word. And then here are all the words that follow that word. Um, and I can easily count up all of these things and then normalize by the count of the prefix to get my probabilities. So you can extend this approach based on how much uh, space you're willing to, uh, or your computational resources and so on. Maybe you're not, you can do better than just this bigram um, assumption. You can add one more word to your prefix. So now you have what's called a trigram model. You can go up in order of your uh, count-based language models. And eventually this class of models that we're talking about are called n-gram models. So n defines, you know, how many words are we considering in the prefix plus the, um, the current word. So, this is called a bigram model, right, by referring to two, because there are two total words in the sequence that we're considering. This is a trigram model because we're considering, you know, the probability of a three-word sequence here. So in practice, if you want to get a higher order of n, you need a lot more data in order to estimate the counts properly because you will have to deal with a lot of sparsity as well. There are special approaches to handle both of these, these issues, which we won't talk about in this class, but um, yeah, you're, you're free to look up and I'll allude to them towards the end of the lecture. Uh, okay, so when we are um, doing this approximation for the conditional probabilities, then when we're um, using the chain rule to get the uh, joint probability, we're basically doing this approximation to each component in the product, right? So here in our chain rule um, approximation, um, you see that instead of this subscript here, W sub one would be the uh, full chain rule. Here, we're only looking at a window of from I minus K to I minus one. So some um, subsequence of that, that prefix. All right, so the simplest possible case is a what's called a unigram model. So instead of, of uh, probability of the given that, a unigram model is even simpler. It doesn't even consider a prefix at all. So a unigram model would say, this is approximated by the probability of the word the, like without any sort of prefix. Um, it's very easy to get the probability of the given some large collection of text. How, do you, how, how would you do that? What do you have to do? Exactly. So I would just count up from all the words in the data set, how many of them are the, and divide by the total number of words. 
and I get the probability of the in the in the data set. Obviously, this is a terrible way of modeling the probability of this um, th this conditional probability, right? It's a terrible approximation, but it's also really easy to do, and it actually turns out to be quite useful in many situations. So this model is called a unigram model. We see that there's nothing we're conditioning on. We're just basically looking at the frequency, the occurrence frequency of the word W sub I. Um, and if we're taking the joint probability, that just becomes the product of all these individual word frequencies, essentially. So another property of language models is that you can generate text from them. Um, and unigram models being terrible, the text that you can generate from a unigram language model looks completely incoherent. There's no grammar being followed here. There's nothing um, remotely understandable about this text here. Uh, more broadly, if you consider what we've discussed so far, how would you use a language model to generate text like this? What are some approaches? Exactly. So um, remember that at any point in a sequence, a language model gives you a probability distribution of what the next word is conditioned on the prefix, right? So given a probability distribution, I could do many things. I could say I'm going to generate the most probable word, or I could say I want to generate, I, I want to randomly sample from this distribution, or I could do some approaches in between. But in general, that's how we generate text from one of these language models. So based on that, why do you think that this text here generated from a unigram model looks as um, like gibberish? Why, why might that be, given this process for generating text that we just described? Would you expect text from a, generated from a unigram model to be coherent English? Why not? Right. So there is no structure of the language that is modeled in a unigram model. It's solely modeling the frequency of the words, right? So let's say I'm generating the first word here. It happened to generate fifth. That would mean I have like a distribution of basically the word frequencies, and I pick a word from that. So here I picked fifth. And then I go on to generate the next uh, word. So here, at this point, I don't know that I've generated fifth because this model has no knowledge of what came before it. And so I pick another word just based on the word frequencies, and then I proceed to the third word. Again, I have no knowledge of my prefix, and so in general, I get something that looks uh, completely incoherent. Does that make sense? So you can see the effect of adding more and more words to the prefix in terms of the quality of generated text. So if you train a unigram model, a bigram model, a trigram model, a foregram model on Shakespearean plays, you can see that the one-gram model is just complete garbage, as we already saw. The bigram model is a little bit better. You see some like vague hints of coherence in terms of at least grammatic grammaticality, so he is this, is uh, you know, a viable um, sequence here. Why does stand? It's not good, but uh, you know, it, it's better. The trigram model is doing even better, um, and will rid me these news of, I mean, it's, it's still bad, but uh, therefore the sadness of parting, as they say, tis done. You know, these things don't mean anything, really, but at least it's looking more like, um, a, you know, English, or at least Shakespearean English. And a four-gram model, you know, um, a great banquet served in uh, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it, it's getting better. So you can see that as the model has access to more words in the prefix, it's producing better estimates of the next word. And that is reflected in the quality of the text that we generate. OK, I forgot to look at these questions. Uh, first question, won't you get the same word again and again if you generate text using a unigram model? Uh, that's a good question. It depends on how you're generating text from the unigram model. If you're generating text simply by taking the most probable word, in a unigram model, that's always going to be the most frequent word, which is probably the, 
So the text you get is going to be the, 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 the. In this example, they were not using the max probability word at every time step. They were sampling from the distribution. So you sample a word in proportion to its probability in the distribution. That's how you get different words. We'll talk a lot more about how you decode or generate text from a language model later on in the semester. Uh, does a unigram model generate the word that is most oh, I think this question is, uh, is answered by my response to the previous question um, because we were sampling from the distribution here. So it doesn't say anything about how that fifth was the most frequent word in this corpus. How is punctuation handled by these models? Okay, so we'll have a whole lecture on tokenization, which is the process in which you take a string and you split it into words or subwords or characters or whatever, and what effects this can have on your underlying language model. Um, but uh, I guess broadly, punctuation is handled uh, just as any other word. So there's, there's nothing special about a period or an exclamation mark. In a, a model like this, something like uh, you see here apostrophe M, it, it really depends on how you want to handle a particular punctuation mark. Usually periods are their own word and contractions are generally um, their own word like the, the suffix apostrophe NT or apostrophe M or so on. But it depends and this process is called tokenization. So if you're interested in reading more about that ahead of time, you, you can look up that term. Questions from the real, yes? Okay, so the question is, how do we decide the value of n in the n-gram model? So how many words in the prefix we are considering? Um, it really depends on how much data you have in order to count. And so we'll get into how you actually do this in a bit. But if you have a very small data set, intuitively you should not use a high order of n because that means that your, your statistics that you get from this tiny data set are probably not representative of the broader n-gram statistics for that value of n, just because you observed only a very small amount of n-grams from your data set, because it was so small. Um, so sparsity is really a huge issue here, and you really need a lot of coverage over the different types of n-grams before you can use a higher uh, order of n. Um, so, in general, you might need you know, hundreds of billions of words if you wanted to use, say, like a 10-gram model. Um, yeah, so if you have a tiny piece of a, a tiny data set, something like a bigram or trigram model, trigram model is probably the, uh, a good starting point. How do we measure the performance of a model? We will talk about that later on in this lecture. We use a metric called perplexity. Um, it's just a function of the probability of a sentence that the model has not seen before. Um, basically, we have not um, estimated our counts from this sentence. It's held out. So the model should assign a high probability to a real sentence that occurs even if the model hasn't seen it before. Other questions? How we, how we can do different kinds of analysis? Because if my data set is very small, in that case, we will get a lot of paper and the zero kind of particular. Okay. In that case, how can we use them? Because probably it will come up with zero in every case because of my data factor. Yeah, so the question is how do we handle cases where I observed zero count for a particular bigram or something in my training data set? Won't that just make the probability of anything containing that bigram zero? Um, if I use it for sentences outside of this training data set. That, that is the case, and there are methods that are in the class of smoothing um, that we will briefly talk about at the end here that directly address this problem. All right, let us continue. Um, so we talked about n-gram models. We know that these are limited models of, they're limited language models, right? Because even if I have a 10-gram model, it's not going to be able to handle long distance dependencies. For example, if you have the sentence, the computer which I had just put into the machine room on the fifth floor crashed. Here, crashed is referring to the word computer, which occurs, you know, like one, two, three, four, a lot of words um, in the before crashed, right? So there's this whole like clause that's inserted in the middle of this sentence 
Um, so any model, like a trigram model, four-gram model, a 10-gram model, is not going to have access to the word computer. And so its prediction of the word crashed is probably going to be much lower than it would be if it had computer in the, uh, in the prefix. Um, so there are different techniques to handle this within n-gram models. Like sometimes you can do something like a skip-gram model, so you can look at uh, you know, every other word or every three words. Um, there are other models where you might be able to look at, uh, you know, different parts of speech in the prefix and ignore, you know, the some words that are of a certain part of speech. But in general, n gray models are limited because they cannot handle long distance dependencies. All right, so let us get to estimating bigram probabilities. We'll start with these bigram models because they're very easy to think about and visualize in the form of the, the count tables. Um, and basically, we are just going to be talking about counting and dividing in, in this lecture. So nothing more fancy than that. Um, in the case that we want to estimate a bigram model from a data set of text documents, we're basically going to use something called the maximum likelihood estimate to get these conditional probabilities of word w sub i condition on word uh, w word w sub i minus one. Um, and so the maximum likelihood estimate is just the uh, in this case since we're counting up, it's the relative frequency of this uh, bigram based on how often it occurs in the data set that we have. So um, to get this in the case of a bigram model, we would count up all the sequences of w sub i minus 1 followed by w sub i and divide it by the count of the prefix, which is the count of w sub i minus 1. This is just the unigram frequency of w sub i minus 1. Um, OK, so this is pretty clear. Uh, let's go through a very simple example to uh, hopefully make it more clear. So I have three sentences in this data set. The, the uh, S here is the start of sentence token, and the end S here is the end of sequence token. So in language modeling and in most uh, NLP tasks involving sequences, we generally have a start of sequence symbol and an end of sequence symbol. We will see in language modeling that the end of sequence symbol is actually necessary in order to get valid probability distributions. There will be an exercise on this next week. We're not going to have the quiz this week um, that gets you more familiar with, with that and why that is. But let's say I have these three sentences, and I'm interested in these bigram probabilities. So let's start with this one, the probability of i given the start of sequence symbol. So how do I do this? I will look for all occurrences of the start of sequence symbol, right, the prefix. So I found three of them. They always occur at the beginning of sequence. And then I look for what is the identity of the next word in each of these three cases. So in the first uh, sentence, it's i. The second sentence, it's Sam. And in the third sentence, it's I. So two of the three occurrences of the start of sequence symbol were followed by the word I. Hence, my conditional probability is two thirds. So let's apply a similar approach to calculate this conditional probability of Sam given the start of sequence symbol. What is that? Yeah, one third, right? This, is, this only happens one time when the start of sequence symbol occurs. So it's one third. And what about the probability of Sam given M? So let's see here. How many times does M occur? It looks like it occurs twice. And here, on this case, uh, Sam occurs after M. In this case, uh, the end of sequence symbol occurs after M. So this conditional probability is one half, right? All right, good, I was right. Um, yeah, so uh, this is very simple. I'm just counting the occurrence of the full two-word sequence and dividing it by the probability of the prefix word. Count and divide. Okay, so at this point, let's uh, take a step back. There's some terminology that's important for you all to know because we'll be using it over and over this semester. 
Uh, I've just been saying word this whole time, but there is a distinction that's important. And so in our vocabulary, so let's say I have a data set. My vocabulary consists of all unique words in that data set. So here, Sam, I am, start of sequence symbol, end of sequence symbol, do not like green eggs and ham. All of these are unique words in my vocabulary. Um, a token is any occurrence of one of these word types. So there are two tokens um, associated with the word type Sam. Basically, that's, that's uh, how you can understand it. There are three tokens corresponding to the start of sequence symbol and, uh, and so on. So a token is an occurrence of the, the word type in the data set. A word type is a unique word in the vocabulary. So my distributions here will be over word types, right? The vocabulary, the unique words in the vocabulary, not the word tokens, which are, um, uh, you know, because this Sam is not different from this Sam in, in the probabilities that were computed. All right. So let's take a look. Yes. Yeah, so a period is a word type, a comma is a different word type, uh, exclamation point, yeah. All of those are handled like that. Okay, so let's take a look at a bigger um, example that was part of your reading as well. So um, if you remember, there's this Berkeley restaurant project, sentences, data set, there are a bunch of sentences uh, about um, food and restaurants and so on and they estimated a bigram model from this data set. So when you're doing this computationally, you probably want to form some sort of table. So this is a bigram count table. The rows here represent the prefix word, and the columns represent the next word, the, the, the one where, so like this cell is the count of I want. This is the count of want to, this is the count of to eat, and so on. So very easy to you know, count up all of these things. And on this slide, there's, we're just showing a subset of the much bigger actual bigram table formed by this whole data set, right? And remember, on the, the rows and the columns here, these correspond to word types, not word tokens, right? So each of these will be unique word types. Okay. Um, so then, what, knowing that then, what is the size of this, uh, the full bigram count table? Like how many cells do I have to store if I want a bigram? Right, the size of vocabulary squared. So now you can see the um, consequence of increasing the order of n, right? If I want a trigram model, now I have vocabulary cubed and, and so on. So this can get really big, really fast. All right, so let us then go from our count table to our, and the way we do this, we already know, is we just normalize the counts by the unigram um, count, the, the count of the prefix. So here, this is the probability of want given i, so I basically took the count here and divided it by the count of um, i, and that's how I got this probability, right? So it's 827 divided by 2533. Does that make sense? So now I have this count table, and you can see that in blue, I have all of these zeros uh, going back to, to your question. So this kind of makes sense, right? There's zero probability for want given want. Um, there's zero probability for Chinese given Chinese. So these like repetitive um, uh, words are not observed in real data. Um, but this can pose complications when they're legitimate cases of this is a grammatical bigram and it just never occurred in this data set. Um, it shouldn't have zero probability, and that has a lot of issues for um, using this language model for uh, other sentences outside of this data set. So we'll talk about that a bit later. But now that we have our conditional bigram probabilities, we can start get, uh, estimating the probability of sentences. So 
if I wanted to estimate the probability of start of sequence, I want English food end of sequence. This is just a product of these five um, conditional probabilities here. Remember that the start of sequence symbol occurs at the beginning of any sentence, so its probability is one. We don't have to include it in this computation. Um, the end of sequence symbol is important because the end of sequence symbol will happen more often after some certain uh, words. For example, periods, any punctuation mark is likely to end a sentence. Um, here it seems like we don't have a period for whatever reason. But we can multiply together all these probabilities and get the joint probability for the sentence. So going back to your question, um, what happens as I have longer and longer sequences? I keep multiplying these probabilities. Some of them are very tiny, right? A lot of them are super small. And so if I have a long document, how am I going to be able to get the probability because I will run into all these underflow errors? Um, so just like you said, we will just use logs to avoid this kind of underflow. So if you think about the log probability of uh, the sentence, we can rewrite this as a sum of the uh, log probabilities, these conditional log probabilities. So given the sentence, uh, this is from a sentiment analysis data set. Someone wrote the sentence, I love, 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 love the movie. Um, with a unigram model, you would get the probability of I times the probability of love to the fifth power, or it occurs five times, um, probability of the times the probability of movie, and you get this really small number. Um, but if we just add the logs, uh, instead of uh, doing the multiplication of the raw probabilities, we have a much more manageable number. So in practice, in all our implementations and so on, we will be using log probabilities rather than raw probabilities for, for this reason. Okay, so let's take a step back from these counting and dividing, uh, building tables and so on, and look at what has a bigram model learned about language. So let's say you estimated a bigram model. What has it even learned? Um, so it's learned, for example, basic grammar. You know, the probability of two given want might be quite high in this data set. Um, that's uh, infinitive verb construction to want. Um, I'm sorry, want to. Wait, is that a, any linguist here? No? All right. Maybe I'm not wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, the probability of want given spend is zero because this is not grammatical. So even this bigram model can, can realize that, you know, this probably shouldn't exist. Uh, here we have the probability of eat given to, so to eat. This is a higher probability than uh, the zero probability to food, which doesn't make sense. Um, and it's learned you know, something about the world, right? People may want English food or Chinese food or so on. So um, it's learning a mixture of these syntactic and semantic properties. And the kind of knowledge only increases as you increase the order of the n. Eventually, we'll talk about neural language models, which can handle way longer prefixes. It's on the order of thousands of words. And these, of course, can learn far more complex relationships about language in terms of you know, uh, discourse structures that uh, range across many different sentences or paragraphs or so on. So uh, we'll, we'll get to that point eventually. If you want to use an n-gram model, you probably shouldn't write your own, although it might be a fun exercise. But you know, it takes a lot of engineering to make these things um, efficient and compact. And so there are some toolkits. Uh, KenLM is one that I've used uh, quite a bit in the past. It's it's very good, and you can just you know go to the site, input your training data to the the library, and get an ngram model, which you can use to. Uh, you know, get the probability of any piece of text or sample, uh, so get like text generated from the language model. All right, so any questions at this point before we talk about evaluation? All right, um, 
So let's say we've estimated a language model on the data that we provided it. So we counted up all the occurrences of all of these words and the bigrams. We did our division. We got this table. The table it basically defines our model, right? All of the things that the model needs to know to get the probability of a sentence is encoded in this table, these conditional probabilities, right? How good of an estimate is this, uh, this table that we have? So if you think about it, what do we want a language model to do? Um, it should assign a higher probability to sentences that are actually real, valid um, sentences in, say, English. Let's say in, the, in this lecture we're just talking about English. Uh, of course, you can train a language model on any, any um, language, although in some languages the act of tokenization is pretty difficult. So some languages don't um, you know, distinguish words with white space, and so it's harder to um, you know, actually construct these kinds of tables. But uh, we'll talk about all of that later. Right now, for sake of example, let's say we're talking about English. We would like our language model to assign higher probability to real English sentences and lower probability to ungrammatical or invalid or nonsensical sentences. Um, and the way we do this is using a common paradigm that is used in any machine learning application. We train our language model on some set of data, which is called the training set. And train in the context of language model means we count these uh, occurrences of um, bigrams and words and so on. And then we evaluate our model on some data that the model has never seen before. So this is called our test set. And to evaluate a language model, so let's say I've estimated a bigram model, a trigram model, a foregram model on the same training data set, I would like you know, a single score that tells me which one of these models is better than the other or allows me to rank these models in some way. So that we're going to use an evaluation metric called perplexity to do this. And perplexity is just a function of the probability of this test set. So a language model can assign a probability to any piece of text. We would like it to assign a high probability to the real English sentences that occur in our test set. So um, we saw that you know, the generated sentences get better and better as we increase the model size, but this is, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it depends on the size of the training data as well. So maybe you would get to a case where increasing the order no longer improves the quality of the generated text. Um, and we basically want something that uh, gives us a higher probability on the test set. So we're not going to be looking at the quality of the generated text, although that's another thing we will talk about uh, later on in the semester. So let's look at a concrete example. I use a bunch of New York Times articles to estimate my bigram conditional probabilities using this, this table, right? We just count and divide. So I take these articles, I get my bigram table, and now I'm going to evaluate them using some held out data, some test data that comes from a different set of articles. So here they come from the Washington Post. So the model has not been uh, estimated on this Washington Post data set, right? So even though the model hasn't seen text from the Washington Post, we would hope that if this were a good language model of English, it would be able to assign a high probability to the text in the Washington Post, right? Because these are real, valid sentences, and so it should certainly be able to assign them a higher probability than it does, say, like jumbled up nonsense text. So that's the general idea. And a model that assigns a higher probability to this Washington Post text than, say, another... So let's say we train a bigram model and a trigram model on the New York Times, it's likely that the trigram model will assign a higher probability to this held out Washington Post text than the uh, bigram model. And similarly, a bigram model would assign higher probability to this text than a unigram model would. At some point, though, if we uh, keep increasing the order of our uh, n-gram model, so higher order meaning higher n for n-grams, yes, that's, that's what I mean. Um, if we keep increasing the order, also referring to the 
uh, prefix length, um, the combined prefix length plus the next word. Um, we will get to a point where our probability of the held out data starts to decrease. Um, so why might this be? So, it, you know, we might have an uh, in, increasing probability as we go from unigram to bigram to trigram to foregram. But if we get to, say, 70 gram, maybe our probability here is much lower than that of a bigram model. Why, why might that be? Exactly, because the model, that 70 gram model, does not generalize to the held out text because a 70 gram model is far too sparse it, to, to generalize. So another way to say that is this model overfit to the training data set, meaning it does a very good job of modeling the, the New York Times articles that it was trained on, but it's so specialized to these articles, like all of these 70 grams may only occur in the New York Times and may never occur at all in the Washington Post. And so we have no real way to use this model on text that it's never seen before. So there's some sweet spot at which a model will be good on both the training data but also on the held out data. And that's the kind of model that we want to, to achieve. So it's very important to get a model that generalizes to uh, text that it has never seen before. And um, if this is the case, it's very important that our test data contains sentences that never occur in the training data at all, and that there's no overlap at all between these two types of data, right? And in general, in any machine learning application, you'll probably hear, you know, never train on your test set, right? Because that's just going to inflate your numbers on the held out data. And it's going to make it such that you don't really know which model is better than the other because you're not actually um, doing a meaningful evaluation. So again, as I said, this is generally applicable to basically anything you're doing in machine learning or any ML application. If you do this on your final project, you will lose a lot of points, so don't do it. All right, so let us get to the actual evaluation metric that we use, which is called perplexity. So given some held out test set, we're going to compute a score called the perplexity and use that to compare different language models that are trained on the same training data set. And the intuition here is basically like if we have a model that can predict the next word, so I can always order pizza with cheese and blank, um, we want a model that can assign high probability to something that's actually plausible in this context, like mushrooms, pepperoni, anchovies, and low probability to things that are not, like fried rice or the word and doesn't make sense here at all. Um, so this we've talked about in general is um, basically the intuition behind a language model. We want a metric that evaluates how well we predict the next word on um, a held out data set. So we can measure that using just the raw probability of the training data set, right? So we want a model that assigns higher prob sorry, the raw probability of the test set. We want a model that assigns higher prob probability to the test set than um, some other competing models. Perplexity is just an exponentiated version of that raw probability. Um, so you can look at the example here. Here, the capital W is uh, the uh, test set, let's say, all the, the words in the test set. Um, or it could be, you know, like a test document or something. We can compute the probability of this test sequence under the language model, right? P of W sub 1 to P of W sub n. And we raise it to the minus 1 over n power, where n is the length of the sequence, the number of words there. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about the ways to break down this joint probability distribution, right? So we, if you go through this computation here, um, we break this down using the chain rule. So now we get the product of these uh, conditional probabilities. And in a bigram model, we're obviously not considering the entire prefix, but just the last word. So this would be the um, uh, equation for perplexity for a bigram model. 
And note that this is the inverse probability. Uh, this is a negative exponent. Um, and so minimizing the perplexity is equivalent to maximizing the probability. So the two are directly related. And you might ask, you know, why do we use this perplexity thing instead of just measuring the probability of the test set? Uh, there are some historic reasons why we do this. Perplexity is um, related to a lot of information theory concepts. In fact, it's just the exponentiated entropy, um, as we'll see in later lectures. Um, but as an intuition, you can think about perplexity as a measure of the branching factor of a language model. And what I mean by that is, uh, maybe it's better to illustrate with this example, let's say we have a sentence that uh, consists of random digits. Um, and so there are 10 digits, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this is essentially like a unigram model, right? That's completely random. And the question, what is the perplexity of this sentence according to a model that assigns p equals one tenth to each digit? So each digit is equally as probable as any other digit. This is a completely, a model trained on completely random numbers. Um, so if you think about it, each uh, of these conditional probabilities, right, w sub 2 condition on w sub 1, all of them are 1 tenth uh, in this scenario. So you have 1 tenth raised to the n, where n is the length of this sequence. And in the perplexity computation, uh, when you take this inverse exponentiation, it just becomes 10. So that means that given any prefix, this model thinks that there are 10 equally likely things that could follow this, uh, this prefix. So intuitively, if you have a language model of, let's use this example of pizza with cheese, here there's, say, three words uh, that the model is predicting, or maybe let's say two words that the model is predicting a significant probability for, a significant conditional probability for. And there are many, many words that the model is not putting much probability mass on at all, right? So maybe the perplexity here would be very, very low, indicating the branching factor is something like three or four. There, there are that many continuations of this, this prefix. So intuitively, you can think, think about it as how many you know, equally valid continuations of this prefix does the model think exist? All right, so this slide here is just getting to what we'll be talking about in future lectures when we discuss uh, models that we actually train, um, not models where we're just counting and, and dividing. Um, we are training models that are directly optimizing the log probability of word sub i conditioned on the entire prefix. Um, and so in this formulation, the perplexity is just the exponent of the cross entropy loss that we compute in, uh, sorry, the exponentiation of the cross entropy loss that we compute in these situations um, at the token level. So this does not have to make sense to you now. It will make sense to you in a couple of lectures. So again, if you didn't remember anything that I just said, uh, perplexity, if you have a lower perplexity, you have a better model. That's the, the takeaway of the, the uh, evaluation metric. Um, lower perplex perplexity of the test set corresponds to higher probability of the test set. So you can see here, uh, someone trained a language model on 38 million words from the Wall Street Journal. They tested it on 1.5 million words from articles that were held out of the training set. So the model never saw those, those articles. You can see that a Unigram model had a perplexity of 962, a bigram model of 170, a trigram model of 109. So the perplexities are getting lower and lower, indicating that the trigram model is doing a better job than the unigram or bigram models um, at measuring the probability of this test set. Okay, any questions at this point? And also, I guess, I'm just saying, like, uh, we don't use to this, like, uh, 
So we can define the position. So now we're doing single. So how do we to kind of modify our scale space so that we can get the result? Yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, the question is referring to cases where our training data and our test data might come from different distributions. So we might train our language model on Shakespeare and then test it on Wall Street Journal. Our language model is probably not good here compared to tra uh, testing it on language, on documents that come from Shakespeare's time, right, or our plays or something like that. So yeah, this is important. Um, generally, when you do this kind of thing, people test their data from the test, their test sets come from the same distribution as their training set. So you see here, the test set also comes from the Wall Street Journal. So there's no issues of language change or anything like that. But nowadays we have, you know, extremely large language models trained on very diverse data that could account for language from not only different eras or genres, but also different languages entirely. So we have single language model estimated on data that comes from hundreds of different languages now, all within the same model. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about all of that later on. But uh, yeah, it's definitely something that people look into. In these kinds of cases, if you have a language model, you're trying to show that your language model is better than another one, generally your test set will come from the same distribution as your training set. Other questions? So if you think about it in this case, in a unigram model, this, this model is saying that at any point in the, in the sequence, the test sequence, this model thinks that there is about 962 equally valid um, options to choose from. And again, this comes purely from the frequency of those words, right? So this never changes. Um, the bigram model, you can see, is, is, it has a lower branching factor, which means the model is better. It's more confident in a smaller set of words that can follow this, uh, this prefix. And trigram model has an even lower branching factor. So it just says that the model is able to use the uh, added information that it has about the prefix to narrow down the choices of what word can follow next. No, it, it, it uh, so the question is, if we just increase the order of the n-gram model off this chart to like from trigram, four gram, five gram, all the way to like 100 gram, will we keep saying, seeing reduction in perplexity? So if this were training perplexity, then yes, but this is the test perplexity. So no, you would see it going down to some point and then start going up because the model at like a 100 gram model will be way too sparse to generalize to uh, the held out data that it's never seen before. Okay, so at this point, we've covered evaluation, but we still haven't covered the issue that someone raised about what happens when we have uh, zero count for a particular bigram that occurs in the test set. So remember that if we are computing the probability of a test sequence, any bigram that occurs in that test sequence that has zero probability under our language model will make the entire probability of that sentence zero, right? Because it's a product of the conditional probabilities. Um, and so that is going to make it hard for us to give an accurate estimate of the model's perplexity because maybe, you know, every sentence contains a zero probability bigram and then uh, it says that the probability of the test set is zero, even though it's actually doing a good job at modeling many of those, those bigrams. So uh, this is, you know, a pretty big issue. If you look at Shakespeare as a corpus, uh, like all of the plays that he wrote, he produced 300,000 bigram types. So here, remember, type is a unique occurrence of a bigram. And the vocabulary squared, the size of that is 844 million. So only a small fra fraction of that bigram table is non-zero. 99.96% of the table is just zero. 
And not, so some of those are dumb things like and, and, or want, want, that won't occur really unless you have some uh, out of distribution text. But many of these uh, engrams are actually valid and they just, Shakespeare never used them because he only wrote a finite number of uh, plays. So in the training set, you have things like denied the allegations, denied the reports, denied the claims. In the test set, you have denied the offer, denied the loan, but these were never observed in the training set, even though we all know that these are acceptable uh, trigrams, right? So we do something called smoothing to address this problem. And we're not going to talk about any sort of uh, concrete smoothing algorithm. There are many different ones that have been proposed. If you look through the uh, language modeling toolkits, you'll find implementations of many different smoothing algorithms. But in general, I just wanted to highlight the intuition of smoothing so you understand how it works. So here, let's take a look at, again, our, uh, the, the example from before, denied the allegations. So basically, the prefix here is denied the, and we're looking at all the words that follow this. So um, if we don't apply smoothing, so we just directly estimate these trigram probabilities here, of probability of a word given denied the. We see in our training set, we have three occurrences of allegations, two of reports, one of claims, and one of requests. And so other words that are also uh, probable here, they just never occur in the training set uh, following the prefix denied the include attack, uh, man, or outcome. So if we want to be able to model these zero probability bigrams or trigrams, um, one thing that we can do is just steal some of the probability mass from the observed data that we have and move it to the unobserved data. So here you can see that we stole one half of each count from the observed count. So now allegations goes from 3 to 2.5. Reports, sorry, reports goes from uh, uh, 2 to 1.5. Claims from 1 to 0.5 and so on. So we've stolen a, a cumulative mass of two counts. And we're going to evenly distribute those counts across all of the unobserved words that are, are in the vocabulary that we have no count for. So these now have a very, very small value. That's not zero. It's not anything huge because this is distributed over the entire vocabulary. Um, but it allows us to compute these probabilities in our test set when we have never seen something like denied the attack before. Now we have a very small probability for denied the attack. So our probability of the entire sentence that contains denied the attack will be non-zero at least. And so there are many algorithms to determine how much mass should we subtract. Should, it, should this uh, subtraction be conditioned on the type of word or the type of prefix? How should we distribute this mass across the unobserved words and so on? We're not going to talk about any of that in this class, although there are very interesting uh, methods there. But um, just know that this is one way that if you apply smoothing, you can actually measure the probability of the test set, even if it has um, zero count uh, engrams uh, that were in the training set. We're not in the training set, but are in the test set. Does that make sense? At least the intuition. Yeah, so the standard smoothing is called the kinaser nay um, method. It's basically the one that uh, I think is default in, whoops, in, in these toolkits. Um, and it's uh, pretty complex to, to explain on, on one slide. But if you're interested, you can look it up. The, it's spelled K-N-E-S-E-R, and then you can look it up from there. Yeah. No, so, oh, that's a good question. So the question is, do these unobserved words come from the test set vocabulary? So there is a difference. So re remember in a language model, the vocabulary is defined by the word types in the training data set, right? So these are all the words in the training data set, 
that um, the model never observed account for after this prefix. There's another problem, which is what happens if the test set contains a word that never occurred in the training set, right? So to handle that problem, what we generally do in these kinds of models is we replace all low frequency tokens in the training data set with a special token called like unc or, or unknown. And so this means that any very rare word, like maybe any word that occurs one time will replace with this token. And we give it some, so we just treat it as a, as a word type in our vocabulary. So then at test time, if we see a word that is not in our training set vocabulary, we replace it with this onc token and we can model its probability um, just because we've estimated statistics, including this onc token from our training data set. But this smoothing problem is addressing a different case where the words all occur in the training set vocabulary, even if it's from the test set, but the count of the n-gram is zero in the training set, but that n-gram actually occurs in the test set. Uh, yeah, it, it, the unknown token is just treated as any other word type in the in the vocabulary. There's nothing special about it. Yes. So what do you mean the sum of all pro so Uh, I, I'm not quite sure. Maybe you can see me after class and we can discuss it further since we're running out of time here. Sure. All right. Um, so just to wrap up here, uh, you have a couple of things that uh, you need to be conscious of. So first, most immediate, the homework zero. It touches on many of these concepts. It's due on Friday on Gradescope. If you're not on Gradescope, we already got some emails about this. Please uh, send an email to the instructor's Gmail account and we'll add you to Gradescope in the next couple of days. Um, if you're not on Piazza, do the same. Um, we already have some people posting for searching for teammates in the Piazza thread. If you want to form your own project team, please post in that thread. Your proposal is due on February 18th. And again, there's no quiz this week. We will talk about neural language models uh, next class, not next week. So see you then.